Hi, my name is Hilary Fanukin, and I'm going to be giving you an introduction to LD score regression. I'm going to start right where Loic uh, left off. So I'm going to assume that you're familiar already with SNP heritability and its estimation when you have access to individual genotype data. And for this uh, uh, portion, I'm going to talk about how we can estimate SNP heritability using summary statistics. And initially, you might think that this is uh, not too complicated because when you do a GWAS, you get estimated effect sizes. So maybe um, you can convert those and aggregate those somehow into an estimate of heritability. But there's two main complications. Um, the first main complication is linkage disequilibrium. Uh, so as we are familiar with, if you have a single causal variant with a single contribution to SNP heritability, it might be tagged many times by many different SNPs in your GWAS. And so the question of how to aggregate a lot of signal that might be redundant um, introduces one complication. There's a second challenge, which is confounding. And so when we're uh, analyzing GWAS summary statistics, uh, we don't want to be making any really strong assumptions that all of the signal that we see is perfectly clean and due to true effects. Um, but it's important to build in some kind of robustness to potentially uncorrected confounding when we're going to be aggregating genome-wide signal. Um, so these are the two main challenges that uh, we overcame in uh, developing LD score regression, um, one application of which is to estimate SNP heritability. So before I go further, um, I'd like to credit, I think Ben Neal came up with the original idea for the LD score regression framework, and then a whole bunch of us developed it into a suite of methods for uh, estimating heritability related quantities. So returning to, uh, or sorry, before we return to the question of estimating SNP heritability, let's take a step back and talk about LD and summary statistics. So let's suppose that we have here a bunch of SNPs, each of these orange lines is going to uh, represent a single SNP. And let's say that some of our SNPs are in LD blocks and some of them uh, are lonely SNPs that are not in LD with any other SNPs. Uh, now let's suppose that we have a causal variant for the phenotype of interest and it falls in an LD block. If there's a lot of LD, um, then that will lead to an association for all of the SNPs in the LD block. So one causal SNP then leads to association for many SNPs because of linkage disequilibrium. Um, on the other hand, if we have a causal signal at one of these lonely SNPs, then the only SNP that's going to show association is gonna be the causal SNP itself. And so one way to summarize this is the more you tag, the more likely you are to tag a causal variant. So in order for one of the SNPs in an LD block to show association, uh, it could be causal or any of the other SNPs in that LD block could also be causal. On the other hand, for one of these lonely SNPs to show an association, that SNP itself has to be the one that's causal. And so what this means is that under polygenicity, where we imagine that lots of different causal variants are sprinkled throughout the genome, if you have a SNP that has a lot of LD to other SNPs, then it's more likely to tag a causal variant. And so it's more likely to be associated to your phenotype than a SNP with low LD. Uh, and so in simulation, you can show that uh, under a polygenic architecture, so this is no confounding, just random causal SNPs, um, you'll get a, a QQ plot that shows a lot of uh, signal like the one on the left. But then if you uh, quantify the amount of LD at a given SNP as the sum of squared correlations to all other SNPs nearby, you call that an LD score and then we put that on the X axis, then you can see that on average, the mean chi-squared association statistics for SNPs that have a lot of LD are going to be higher than the mean chi-squared association statistics for SNPs with a small amount of LD. And again, this is to be expected um, because all of the SNPs that are over on the right-hand part of the plot have a lot of opportunities to tag a causal SNP because they have a lot of LD, where all of the SNPs on the left-hand side of this plot uh, don't have as much of an opportunity to tag a, a causal SNP. And so they're less likely to be associated on average over many SNPs. On the other hand, if we look at uh, uh, confounding, if we had pure drift, then we wouldn't expect that to affect the association statistics of high LD versus low LD SNPs differently. We just expect it to lead to a slight inflation of association at all SNPs without regard to LD score. And so sure enough, um, in these simulations, doing a GWAS of UK controls versus Sweden controls, 
we again see inflation in our QQ plot, um, but this time there's no relationship between the mean chi-squared association statistic and the LD score. And so uh, this, uh, this uncorrected confounding is leading to uh, an, an inflation of association that's not dependent on the LD score. So what does this look like in real data? Um, looking here at the PGC2 schizophrenia summary statistics, you can see this very strong linear relationship where SNPs with higher LD score have much higher mean chi-squared statistic than the SNPs with the lower LD score. And so what this means is that there's very strong evidence of a lot of polygenic signal um, for schizophrenia and by looking at the intercept of this regression, we can see that this polygenicity actually explains the bulk of the inflation in chi-square statistics as opposed to uncorrected confounding. Uh, so now to formalize this just a little bit, um, and I won't give the full derivation, but here's a sketch. Um, if we uh, start from a linear model for the dependence of phenotype on genotype, and we denote our causal effect sizes B sub K, then the first thing that we can ask is what's, what does our estimated effect size look like uh, when we do a GWAS? So in GWAS, we're estimating marginal effect sizes. So that means that I'll call it beta hat J, our marginal effect size estimate that we obtained through GWAS is not an unbiased estimate of BK, but instead it's an unbiased estimate of the sum of all of the other SNPs of their causal effect sizes weighted by how much LD they have to SNP J. So you can see for one of our lonely SNPs, this RJK would be zero for, for every K except for K equals J. Um, but if you have a big um, LD block, then RJK will be positive for many different choices of K. And so that means that any BK that's non-zero within that block will contribute to beta J. So this gives uh, uh, you know, a, a quantification of what does it mean that uh, one SNP can be associated if any nearby SNP in LD is truly causal. And then we can write our chi-score statistic, statistic as approximately n times uh, beta hat j squared. And now you can ask, uh, so this, you know, rjk beta k tells us how does uh, causal effects work into our marginal effect size estimates. And then we can also ask, what about stratification? Uh, well, stratification will feature in our error term here. And so if stratification has been um, perfectly controlled for, then E will have variance one over N. But if we have uh, stratification, then our beta hats are gonna have a little more variance than they should. So the variance of E will be greater than one over N, um, leading to uh, inflation in our expected chi-square statistic. So if we were going to derive LD score regression, one way we could do it would be to start by deriving this uh, uh, pair of equations that I've written here, um, which I think are also kind of intuitive. And then part two, which I'll leave as an exercise for anybody who's interested in this kind of thing is to show that if we add on top of this, that our beta K are IID with mean zero and variance that's equal to SNP heritability divided by the number of SNPs, and then our expected chi-square statistic where the randomness is now over both B and epsilon uh, has this form. And so this is uh, the, the LD score regression equation where you can see that we have our LD scores here and uh, then the slope is gonna be related to sample size and to person heritability. And then we have an intercept and you can show that the intercept C is gonna be one if there's no stratification. So this comes from our variance of E equals one over N and it'll be greater than one if there is stratification. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge um, Patrick who pointed out, Patrick Turley who pointed out this um, uh, kind of clean version of the derivation. So there's um, uh, been a couple of extensions of this method to do a couple of different things. So if you have similar intuition and similar derivations, we can estimate genetic correlation. And here our model, instead of being that there's one phenotype with one set of causal effects that are randomly distributed, is that uh, we have two phenotypes and that their effect sizes are correlated with each other. And so then we can estimate this correlation by regressing instead of chi-square statistics on LD scores, we regress the product of z-scores on LD scores. Um, and we can also do partitioned heritability. And so here our model is that the effect size variance depends on the annotation of the SNP. So we can have several different categories that a SNP can fall into and then uh, model the effect size variance as depending linearly on those categories. And so then we can estimate heritability enrichment, how much more heritability is there in this category of SNPs than you would expect by chance. 
um, or in, in either um, uh, on its own or in a joint fit model where we're looking for how much does being in this category contribute to person apparent ability after you account for all of the other categories in the model. Um, and to do uh, this estimation, we regress the chi-score statistic on stratified LD scores, um, uh, meaning you have separate LD scores for each of the categories in the model. Uh, LD score regression comes with many caveats, and I'll just list a few here. Uh, large sample is required, especially for genetic correlation and especially for partitioning heritability. Um, we also assume that when you're estimating these LD scores that the LD that you've got from your reference panel matches the LD that you have in your GWAS itself. Um, to the extent that this is uh, not true, then you'll wind up with biased estimates of heritability. Um, and we've looked in recently into um, applying this in admix populations where what we recommend is to use in sample covariate address adjusted LD. Um, instead of using a reference panel, which in uh, the, the studies that we've done don't uh, provide a good enough match. There's also uh, been some work on LD dependent architecture showing that including math and LD bins leads to uh, lower bias and heritability estimates. Um, and also that you can get underestimated heritability if the trait is not very polygenic. Uh, some work on case control traits um, for covariates of very large effect. Um, and also a reminder that as we're uh, uh, making these assumptions, we're assuming that you have data genome wide and that you're not only representing uh, small portions of the genome using custom array data. Um, and the last caveat that I'll put on this uh, slide is that um, mixed model summary statistics also uh, don't behave according to the derivation that I gave earlier. And so they're appropriate for genetic correlation and um, partitioned heritability, but not for heritability estimation itself. Um, where there's uh, uh, no numerator and denominator to cancel out. So I'll close by giving a sample application um, from some of the work that I did with uh, uh, collaborators um, using partitioned heritability to identify disease relevant tissues and cell types. And so stratified LD score regression, which is our tool for partitioning heritability, uh, can take as input a genome annotation corresponding to a tissue or cell type. And so you can think of this as a set of, of SNPs that is active by some definition in that uh, tissue or cell type. Um, so for example, near a gene that's highly expressed or in an epigenetic mark that's activating uh, in that tissue or cell type. And then summary statistics for a trait of interest and then other annotations to control for in a joint model. And then we'll get out a p-value for enrichment for this particular um, tissue. And so we can do that for central nervous system, for the immune system, for liver. Um, and so here is uh, uh, one set of results that we got um, where we ran this method for several different genome annotations corresponding to different disease relevant, or sorry, to different uh, tissues and cell types using gene expression data. And here each point is a different tissue or cell type. And then on the y-axis, we have the minus log 10p for uh, significance for the phenotype. And you can see that for schizophrenia, we got very strong uh, and highly significant enrichments for CNS-related annotations. Um, and similarly for BMI, epilepsy, and other brain-related phenotypes. And then for um, a lot of autoimmune or um, allergy-related phenotypes, we're seeing a strong immune signal. For migraine without aura, we saw a strong cardiovascular signal. Um, and then uh, adipose tissue was enriched for waist hip ratio adjusted for BMI, showing a very different pattern of enrichment than what we saw for BMI itself. Um, liver for LDL, pancreas for type 2 diabetes. And so I think that this shows that being able to partition heritability and leverage this genome-wide signal together with a lot of auxiliary data from gene expression or other sources about which parts of the genome are active in which tissues and cell types gives us a really good way to extract the uh, biological signal out of these genome-wide association studies. And so I think that the next portion um, for you is going to be to learn to run LDSC. And so I will uh, stop here and leave it to the folks who are running the practicum. Thanks. <laughs>